This is Real Estate Rookie episode 352. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And today, we got another Rookie Reply for you guys. We're going to be answering your questions. And if you want to get your question featured on one of our episodes, head over to biggerpockets.com slash reply drop your question there and we might just pick it for the show. So today we're going to be answering two questions on seller financing. Creative financing is hot, hot, hot right now. So if you have questions about seller financing, this is an episode for you. We have a question about scaling and what does that look like for Ricky? And then we finish off with a question about contractors as well. So everyone's favorite thing is working with contractors. We (laughs) talk about how to do it the right way. So uh, last thing before we get into the questions, if you guys haven't yet, please do take a few minutes to leave an honest rating and review of the Ricky podcast on whatever platform it is you're listening. Uh, The more reviews we get, the more folks we can reach. And when we reach folks, we tend to help them. And that's what we're all about here at the Ricky podcast. So take a few minutes, leave that rating review, and we just might read it on the show. Let's get started with our first question from Roosevelt. ABP, what's the best way to get seller financing? Is there a down payment? Is a realtor involved? And what other fees are you associated with getting it? Great question. Seller financing. <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the best way to get seller financing, let's start with that one. My recommendation would be to ask the seller if they would be open to seller financing or just submit an offer that is seller financing. I'm going to go a little contrarian here. And I'm going to say, I think the best way to get seller financing is to actually go bigger. And let me explain myself, right? Um, In the single family space, uh, a lot of times a seller might need to be educated on what seller financing is. In the commercial space, it's far more common, especially if you're going after uh, an older building with maybe a, a retiring owner whose books maybe aren't all that great, a, a property that will be hard to get traditional financing with because there's no P&Ls, there's no tax statements, um, tax returns. In those situations, oftentimes sellers know uh, that they almost have to offer seller financing. So we've got a deal in, uh, in Utah right now. It's a, a 13 unit hotel. And a uh, really nice property. Honestly, the owners did a pretty decent job with it. But uh, one thing they didn't do a great job with was their books. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the property itself isn't necessarily bankable because uh, the P&Ls aren't really up to snuff. There's no two years of previous tax returns to really uh, highlight the property and its real income potential. So the seller knows and is was very willing to offer seller financing to us because they know that if they didn't, they would have to sell it at a pretty major discount uh, for someone to be able to buy it. So my advice is to to kind of go out there and maybe look at some of the, some of the more commercial properties. And we we had AJ Osborne a few episodes ago, um, and he talked too about like people get this misconception sometimes that commercial is more difficult than the single family stuff. But if you find the right deal, um, sometimes commercial might be a little bit easier than getting some of the the single family homes. How do you talk to the sellers when you're looking at the deal and your their books are horrible? And maybe they did they ask for like say they would do seller financing or did you have to ask for it? For this specific deal, I don't remember. I want to say that they might have offered it because we'll, we'll even just search like because we're looking at at like small motels and hotels. Like there's only so many across the country that kind of fit our buy box. But like when we're searching on Crexy, one of our search parameters is literally seller financing. Right or seller carry, and we'll we'll try and find those owners that are already open uh, to having that conversation. But um, I, I think on this one, honestly, they I think they might have offered it to us, like just from the jump, like hey, if you guys want it, oh, okay. and then we just had to negotiate the the terms on that one. How would you do that if it wasn't if they hadn't offered it? How would you kind of approach the seller as to what this is why you should do seller financing and kind of uh, explain like nobody's going to be able to get a loan from this right. property because your bookkeeping sucks. <laughs> and that's what we tell them from, from the beginning, right? It's like, Hey, can we see your, can we see your P and L's? And they'll send us like some photos they took on their, their old flip phone. Um, and we'll, we'll ask for tax returns and, you know, it'll show that the, the, the property lost half a million dollars every year for the last six years. Um, and we can go back to them and say, Hey, look, we really like the property. Uh, we, we feel that what you're asking for is a fair price. But this property is impossible to get good bank financing for. So if we do have to go out, we're going to have to go out and get some kind of 
you know, hard money lender, short term bridge debt that's very expensive, which is going to pull down the purchase price that we can offer to you because we still have to get our, our returns. But if you're open to it, we can give you your purchase price. We just need to kind of work out better terms on the seller financing. And, you know, we've made that pitch to a few um, commercial properties as well. And, and you know, a lot of them are biting um, because I think they understand that, that they can't move that property uh, given either its condition or the condition of their, their books. Or they just wait and hold out because they think they can get a cash offer. Somebody is going to come in with the golden ticket. Yeah. <laughs> with the golden ticket, right? I did just pull up, uh, you had mentioned Crexy, but I pulled up landwatch.com. And right now across the U.S., they currently have 13,954 listings that are owner financing right now that specifically say the person is open to doing owner financing. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like, just imagine if you, like, hired a team of VAs to, to come through all 13,000 listings. How could you not get at least one of those deals? Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, you're almost guaranteed to, to at least get one. It's a volume. It's like a numbers game. I think that, honestly, could coincide with Ariel, who we had on episode 349 a couple episodes ago. And I'm sure she has some tech that we can use to have somebody <laughs> yeah. come through all of those listings. <laughs> I think that was honestly like one of my favorite most recent episodes. Like if you guys haven't listened, I go back and listen to it. But Ariel had some really cool like web scraping tools that she had kind of put together to to systematize that process. But yeah, I couldn't, couldn't have said it better, Ash. But what about for you? You've done some seller financing as well. What, what does that look like for you? How did you kind of broach that conversation with the with the uh, with the seller? What kind of documents were involved? Like like walk through what it looked like for you. Yeah, and I can kind of tie this into the second part of the question: Is there a down payment? Is there a realtor involved? And what other fees are associated with getting it? So I'll do the my first time ever doing seller financing. I'll do that as an example. And I actually uh, was buying a couple properties from this person, and the only way that I could do it was if one of the properties was seller finance and the rest I was going to purchase with my line of credit. So there was no real estate agent involved. And I think this is a lot easier in states where you need to use an attorney to close, which New York is one of those. So my attorney drew up the paperwork for the seller financing, put it into the purchase uh, purchase contract for the property. And I didn't really have to do anything. What I did was create a letter of intent so in my letter of intent, it stated the purchase price, the property, the buyer, the seller, and the terms of the purchase. So if there was any contingencies, one of the contingencies was this is, um, you know, valid upon attorney approval. Uh, also the terms. So what I did was I put a $20,000 down payment. Uh, the rest was seller financed for a 12 month term at 7%. And it was interest only payments until the full balance would be paid at the end of the 12 months. That is one of the nicest things about seller financing is the terms can be whatever you agree upon, whatever you negotiate. So you could do a 50 year fixed at 3% interest rate. You could do a uh, 50% down payment. You could do no down payment. And that's actually very common. What I see in a lot of listings that have seller financing is they will ask for a 50% down payment. And I think that's to attract somebody who maybe has a lot of money, but maybe doesn't have good credit. So they can't go get the, the bank loan. But as an investor, putting down 50% is not attractive to me. I might as well just go to the bank and put down 20%. 20, right. <laughs> yeah. And then as far as other fees associated with it, I would have an attorney draw up your, your seller financing contract. Um, and, or if they put it together, an attorney look it over and approve it. So along with the, the fees, the other fees that are happening are just your usual closing fees. So you, any title work you have done. Um, if you did use a real estate agent, you know, it did the, if you're doing 0% down, you know, is the seller going to still pay the commissions for the agent? Or is that something you work into the agreement where I'm not going to pay a down payment to you per se, but I will pay the seller's commissions or something like that too. That honestly ties pretty nicely into our second question for today, Ash, which is from T Hoover. And T's question is, for those of you that seller finance, do you increase your asking price for the convenience of that seller offering seller financing, or do you sell at the estimated value? And then also, do you charge any interest or other fees for uh, agreeing to uh, that service? So I, I think I just want to break down a little bit because there, there's a few terms we're throwing around. But uh, when you think about seller financing, 
or when you think about any kind of debt, really, um, there are a few levers you can look at. You can look at the term, the amortization period, the interest rate, the down payment, and the interest only period. <laughs> so <clears throat> the term is how long are you going to be making those payments? So as she said for her first one, it was a 12 month term. That means she had 12 months worth of payments. And then there was a, a balloon due at the end of those 12 months. On a typical uh, primary residence, you're, you're either signing up for a 15 year term or a 30 year term, right? And you're gonna you know pay that over the life of 15 years or pay that over the life of 30 years, right? So you, you have your term. Uh, your amortization uh, period is, kind of similar to your term, but slightly different. Your amortization is how far or, or, or over what time period are those payments being stretched out? So uh, you could have a one-year term, but a 30-year amortization. So basically, you would make payments over the course of one year as if you were going to pay for 30 years, right? You'd stretch it out as if you're paying for 30 years, but on, on month 12, instead of paying that regular payment, you're gonna pay the entire balance that's due, right? So your amortization, the longer you can stretch that out, the lower your payments are going to be, right? There was like talk earlier this year, Ash, I don't know if you heard it too, about like the banks starting to offer 40-year mortgages. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. So that, that's an extra 10 years to pay off your mortgage, um, which, you know, would effectively reduce uh, the monthly payment you had to put out. I'd be curious to see if they, if they actually end up doing that. Um, I feel like a lot of people will take it, you know, as an investor, that sounds attractive. Like, yes, more cash flow because I have this lower monthly payment. But as a homeowner, you now are building up less equity in your property because you're paying less to your principal every month now than you would have been with a 30 year mortgage and you're paying way more interest up front. Like you could literally for the first five years only be paying $5 per month <laughs> towards your uh, mortgage payment. And then yeah. what happens if the market does go down and all of a sudden you are now uh, you know underwater in your property because you haven't built up any equity. Maybe you're in an area that doesn't have a lot of appreciation. And that's where I see the concern of people not paying down any equity in their property and then them having to sell and they can't sell because they don't have any equity in it because they haven't paid anything down on it. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky spot to be in, but, um, but that, that is your amortization period, right? Like how long are you stretching out those, those payments? The other piece, like Ash talked about is a down payment. Like what percentage of the purchase price are you putting down up front? Um, and then your interest only period. So like Ashley was just saying, when you make a payment on a typical loan, on a typical mortgage payment, uh, that payment is split between your principal and your interest. So early in the loan, the majority of your payment is going towards, uh, interest. And then as you get later into your loan, the majority of that's going towards your principal pay down. If you have an interest only period, it means you're only paying the percentage of the payment that's going towards your interest. So it means your, your monthly payment's gonna be slightly reduced because you don't have to worry about that principal reduction. Now, the downside to that is that your principal's staying the same. So if you say you get a loan for, you know, whatever, a hundred thousand bucks um, and you're interest only, at the end of whatever period, you still have that $100,000 to pay back, whereas opposed to uh, the principal and interest would be pulling down that $100,000. But if your goal is to maximize cash flow in the short term, it tends to help. I was just going to say like another reason is if you're remodeling the property and you're planning to go refinance, having that low payment as your holding cost instead of paying a high mortgage with principal and interest, you're having less holding costs because you know you're going to go and refinance out of that interest only loan anyways. I think those are all the kind of the big pieces, right, that you would look at when you're when you're doing seller finance in your term, interest only period, amortization, interest rate, down payment, and then purchase price, obviously, too, right? So that, that kind of ties into what T's question was is, you know, you could, in theory, uh, offer a higher purchase price on seller financing, because typically if the seller's financing this note, they don't really care about the appraisal. Um, you just have to, as the buyer, be comfortable knowing that you have a seller finance note out for an amount that's higher maybe than what that property would appraise for. But if the deal pencils out, you know, and you're, you're getting really good cash flow and there's other things that you're getting from that deal, then maybe it makes sense. Um, have you ever done a seller finance deal, Ash, where the purchase price was higher than the appraised value? No, definitely not the appraised value. Um, cause I don't even buy properties at the appraised value, <laughs> even if they're bank finance, <laughs> but, uh, or, you know, any got, even if they're cash deals, I won't buy it if they're, you know, it's what it would appraise for. I always buy under market value, but, um, to go along with that is to, you know, asking the, the different price or whatever, as a buyer, I will submit two offers a lot of times where one is 
you know, a cash offer or, a, you know, getting a bank loan. And the other one is seller financing. And the seller financing offer will be higher. It will be more attractive than getting the bank financing because the bank financing, I'm going to have to pay loan fees. I'm going to have to pay cl uh, more closing costs because of those loan fees. I'm going to have to have an appraisal done. I am probably paying more interest. Um, and then I have the the uh, seller finance offer, which usually I will definitely put way less than what I would get at the bank to make it even more attractive, but also maybe extend it out, make way better terms. And it's more attractive to me. So I want to make it more attractive to them by increasing that purchase price of the property. So I will do that. And I did have um, a real estate agent come back to me one time and be like, 5%, like that's way below market rates what you could get at the bank right now. And this was maybe like two years ago. And I was like, exactly. That's why it would be an incentive for me to pay them more money for, <laughs> to purchase the property. Right. And she was just like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it kind of like clicked, like, okay, yeah. it makes sense though. That's the beauty of it, right? Is that you can, you can really set it up however you and that seller agree to. You know, yeah. like, uh, you know, Pace talks a lot about getting zero down for, for some of his sub two deals. And you know? he has like an apartment complex that's zero down and amortized over 40 or 50 years too. Yeah, it's just crazy, right? And then for the last part of that question, do you charge interest or any other fees for your service? Yes, yeah, so you can definitely charge interest. Most of our examples we've talked about, they do charge interest, but there are deals too where there is no interest. It is literally the balance loan amortized over 10 years or whatever it may be and no interest uh, at all on that loan. So you can get a deal like that. That's great. We are going to take a question from Samuel Hall. This is a question about scaling. So to give us some background, he says, the mortgage for our primary residence is completely in my wife's name. I have one rental property that is cash flowing well. It is owned by a trust between me and family members. The mortgage is in my family member's name and I have no mortgage and one and a half houses. I'm about to be under contract for a cash flowing rental using traditional financing and the mortgage will be in my name. I have about two years of landlord experience. First of all, Samuel, awesome. Congratulations. What a, what a cool start. Yeah. I am working towards the goal of economies of scale and the purchase multifamily units. Are there any benefits to putting loans in my spouse's name? I am aware of the Fannie Mae caps of 10 loans per person, but are there required time periods between the loans? How can I increase my per loan borrowing power? At the amount of my current pre-approval rate, I would not be able to purchase one multifamily even at a discount in my market. How can I get the banks to stop looking at debt to income and start looking at DSCR? At this stage, I am unconsciously incompetent. I don't know what I don't know. Thank you for your response. And thank you for your honesty. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I've, I've never heard that phrase, uh, <laughs> unconsciously incompetent. I know, like I said, I stuttered for a second if I didn't read that right. <laughs> yeah, I like that though. I'm, I might start borrowing that, Samuel. I mean, this, this is a loaded question though, Ash. I mean, let, maybe let's, uh, well, first, like you said, kudos to you on, on already having a few rentals with no debt necessarily tied to your name. Because, it, and this is, you know, maybe just even breaking this down for all the rookie audience first is that the the deed and and you know you know we've heard this from other people before so i pace talked about this when he was on the podcast but uh the deed and the mortgage are two separate documents and when looking at your debt to income ratio they're not looking for deeds tied to your name they're they're looking for mortgages that are tied to your name so you can be on the deed for a property and it won't necessarily count against your debt to income ratio as long as you're not also listed on the mortgage so for you, Samuel, you've got no real estate debt tied to your name right now. So you've got a clean slate. So I, I just want to clarify that for folks to understand that being on the deed and being on the mortgage are two different things. Yeah. So it would just be the one property he's about to close on, correct? Yeah. He's under contract yeah. for one that would be his first one, traditional financing, and the mortgage will be in his name. Yep. Okay. So then the first question is, are there any benefits to putting loans in my spouse's name? I'm aware of the Fannie Mae caps of 10 loans per person, but are there required time periods between the loans? So if they, if you are getting investment loans, there is no time period. If you are getting these loans as a primary residence that yes, you usually have to occupy the one property for one year before you go into the other. 
but it seems like you're purchasing them as investment properties. And as far as I know, there are no time period requirements for this at all. Um, the one thing I would do is maybe wait until you close on the first loan before going and starting the second loan. Um, because if you go and get uh, approved and it's outside of that specific window, it's like 60 to 90 days, I think, depending on who's pulling your credit, where it could actually count against you. Um, and then, you know, they'll do a final like credit check before you close. And I think it's a soft pull. I'm not, I'm not sure, but they'll check again. And that's why they always tell you, like, don't go and buy don't new buy furniture <laughs> before you close on your house and put it on store credit or go buy a new car. Um, Cause they'll ask you why was your credit pulled for this situation and it could mess up your loan. So close on one loan before you go and start the next one would be my advice on that. And then as far as putting them in your spouse's name, I would definitely do that to kind of break up the debt to income for that too. Here's the thing, like uh, just because you guys are husband and wife doesn't mean, doesn't mean you both need to be on the mortgage. The, the goal is to have the least amount of people on the mortgage as possible because that gives you more opportunity to go out and get more loans, right? So uh, like for us, when we were buying um, vacation homes, you know, I had one in my, in my name, my partner had one in his name. Right? We didn't both go on the mortgages because we wanted to leverage the debt to income ratio of ourselves separately. Because the, the crazy part when, the, when they're doing this math is that um, even if one of you could have qualified, if you're both on the mortgage, it counts against both of you. And even if you only own 50% of the home, when they're looking at your debt to income ratio, they're looking at the entire mortgage, not 50% or 25% or whatever percentage you own, they're looking at the whole mortgage. So the least amount of people you can put on the mortgage to get approved, the better. Right. So if your wife can go out and get 10 by herself, get her 10. If you can go out and get 10 by yourself, get your 10 as opposed to getting, because that gives you 20 as opposed to getting 10 in total between the both of you. The next question is how can I increase my per loan borrowing power at my amount of current pre-approval rate? I would not be able to purchase one multifamily, even at a discount in my market. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people is they run out of that bar borrowing power before each spouse even has those 10 loans in each of their names too, especially if you're trying to do this pretty rapidly um, over time. But um, I don't, I honestly don't know, uh, Tony, any way to really yeah. increase your pre-approval besides like getting more income, but then you <laughs> right, have to wait what... until it's on your tax return or, you know, getting a, a letter that you got a new job where you're making mm -hmm. more money and you have your first pay stub. I mean, that's what I would say, right? So uh, income expansion, right? Can you get a side hustle? Um, you know, we had that side hustle series we had. Like but remember, a, it has to be a side hustle that you are tracking and reporting. That you're tracking, income. right? That you're yeah. reporting. Yeah, yeah. And so um, it can't be a little under the, the table type side hustle. Um, but yeah, if you get like a, a second job doing something that, that can bring your income in, promotions, skipping jobs to get a new job. Um, but yeah, the, the income growth, I think, is big. Um, the other thing, too, is like, um, can you can you look at a loan product and this kind of ties into your next question but can you look at a loan product that maybe takes some of the revenue from those properties and allows you to apply it towards your approval amounts um so for example i know that uh naca neighborhood assistance corporation of america we had a guest um gosh i wish i could remember his name but um he he got uh, a multifamily property through naca and so did nancy rodriguez she also got hers through naca oh yeah um yeah. And um, NACA is really cool because it's 0% down. And when you buy multifamily, they'll, and I think you can go up to four units under NACA, but they'll use the rents from the other four units to help offset the cost of ownership for you. So even if maybe you can't afford the entire purchase price, if the market rents for the other units, bring the payment down to a point that you can afford yourself, that's an option for you to get into one of those properties as well. So I, I think the, a big misconception, Samuel, that a lot of new investors have is that they have to fit the box of the loan products that that they're um, that they're aware of. When in reality, you want to go out and find the loan product that matches your unique situation. And guys, there are so many loan products out there. There are so many lenders, so many banks, so many credit unions, so many mortgage brokers, like so many. Um, you just got to do the legwork to find the loan product that matches your unique situation. And Sammy, we don't know what market you're in, but I, you know, I can almost guarantee if you go knock enough doors, you go shake enough hands, uh, make enough phone calls, 
you'll probably find like a, a local regional bank that'll underwrite this deal um, and, and give you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to getting closed. That actually reminds me of an episode we have coming out uh, actually on Thursday. So on Thursday, we have Matthew McDermott uh, talking about how I think it was like 22 banks that he cold called and until he found one that would actually lend to him. So that'd be a great episode to listen to, to talk more about that. The other thing I think to add to that too, right? Like how do I increase my preloan borrowing power is for the, the rentals that you guys have, once they start showing up on your tax returns, um, then you can also use that to kind of offset your, your income as well. Um, we've, we've had one, uh, loan product where it hadn't been a year, but they were able to take a signed lease agreement and use that to like count towards our income as well. So again, it's about having the right lender that understands real estate investing. Um, they can kind of know all these nuances, of, uh, nuances of how to best show your income uh, to the underwriter. Cause like if you go to the bank to get a loan, um, especially on the commercial side, I haven't done a residential loan in a while. So I don't know on the residential side, but on the commercial side, this could be another option for you is switching from residential to commercial. You're not going to get as great of terms though but they will ask you for a personal financial statement. And on that per personal financial statement, they will ask you, what is your rental income for that property? What are the property taxes and the insurance? And what is your net profit? And they really only take into account your uh, mortgage payment for that, your property or property taxes and your insurance. And then they say, oh, great, you're making $10,000 when in reality, you're most likely not because you have repairs, you have maintenance, you have vacancy, all these other things. But that's what they will take that into account and add it to your income to when they have you do those personal financial statements on the commercial side. Even on the short term rental side, I'm starting to see loan products uh, for single family homes in the short term rental space where they're projecting the income as an Airbnb. And then using that to help you get approved for loans. So like, you know, when you're out there and you've got 20, 30, 40, 50 properties, like, you know, the, the debts and income starts to kind of crazy. They're all in your personal name. So it's another loan product as well. So I'd say Samuel, just go out there again, shake some hands, knock some doors, pick up some phones and let people know what it is you're trying to accomplish and ask them, okay, what's the best loan product for me, given my unique situation? And let them tell you what's the, the best option for you. So let's move on to our next question by Juan Alvarez. Any tips that you guys have when dealing with contractors? Is it fair to negotiate with them? Tell them you're getting quotes from others, etc. Question mark. I'm just gonna start reading like I'm a uh, talk texting to my car to like send text messages, and you have to add the question mark in the period <laughs> exclamation Mama, point. Period. Yeah. yeah, smiley face. <laughs> You know what? I haven't done that. Does that actually add an emoji? I'll have to try yeah, I that. don't know. Actually. I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> I assume it does, you know, where it's uh -huh. 2023. I feel like those things are yeah. happening. Uh -huh. But um, but dealing with contractors, I, I always say my, my billion dollar idea is to start a, a general contracting company and just be the guy that picks up the phone. And I feel like I would have clients lined about the door. So, uh, you know, contractors hit or miss, right? Sometimes you're gonna find some amazing ones. Sometimes you're gonna find the ones that run off in the middle of the night with $20,000 of your money. Um, so it, it is tricky, I think, trying to find uh, trying to find the right one. But Ash, you know, you've done a lot of rehabs as well. What's been your experience? Maybe let's, let's handle that first one, the first part of his question. Is it fair to negotiate with him? When I started working for this other investor, long time ago. And before I had any properties of my own, he would have me help with a lot of the bidding for stuff. And I'd be like, okay, this person said it would be this much. And you'd be like, ah, ask him for 5% discount. And I'll be like, oh, I just felt so uncomfortable. I hated it. I disliked it. I was like, I was like thinking inside, like, let's not be cheap. Like, come on, these people are working, like, you know, whatever, like it's fair to pay them this and stuff. Every single time he asked for a discount, he got a discount. <laughs> and eventually I just started doing it on my own. And I'd be like, you'd be so proud of me. Look at, I got a discount. So I don't think that it's unfair um, to ask for a discount. The worst they can say is no. And you say, okay, I just thought I would ask. And you can always, um, you know, try and barter in some way as to maybe why they should give you that discount, you know, maybe you can offer to shout them out on social media or whatever that may be. But no, I don't think it's um, wrong to try to negotiate. What about you, Tony? No, not at all. Right. And I feel like it's almost um, expected 
right? Uh, to For a little bit of haggling. Uh, but I think there's also, to Ashley's point, like you want to make sure that you're balancing that line and, and not just focusing on cost because sometimes the, the cheapest contractor is not the best contractor. And if you've gotten three bids, one comes back at 80,000, one comes back at 75, and one comes back at like 40, um, you, you might want to be a little bit concerned uh, about the 40, right? Because they're, they're maybe underestimating what the job is about. Maybe they're, they have no intentions of actually finishing the job. So you want to you want to haggle, but also compare to kind of see who's ballpark and who's way out of range. Mm -hmm. And the inverse is true, right? Like if you get three bids and two people at 40, one's at 80, well, then don't talk to the 80, right? And, and kind of negotiate with those folks at the 40 line. But I do think it's, it's normal to, to try and negotiate uh, those rates up front. And with getting quotes, build your own scope of work. Yeah. That's something I've had to learn the hard way. Then you can give it to each person that's bidding out and you're comparing apples to apples instead of getting one estimate back that says roof repair, $10,000, uh, roof, soffit, tear off, I, you know, detailed, like this type of roof. Like I, I think it was last year, maybe we did like four roofs of process apartment complex. And like one was literally new roof you know, 50,000 or whatever it was like per building. And then the other one was like super detailed. And then another one was kind of detailed, but also had like the brand of roofing. So it's like to the other ones, like are you using super cheap roofing? Like what's the difference? And mm -hmm. literally it was so time consuming having to go back and forth. And like, but if I would have just went and said, okay, this is, we, we need to know what needs to be torn off. It's a tear off. We want um, ice shield put on. We want, um, you know, a, 40 year guarantee shingle or whatever put on and uh, tell us the brand that you're going to use, what the guarantee is. And, um, you know, that you'll be, you know, doing the caps around the chimney, things like that. Everything. If we would have just done that would have saved so much time. We could have just picked a bed and, you know, went with it, but that would be my recommendation is building your own scope of work and then giving it out to the contractors to actually estimate and that saves them so much time too from having to build out their own scope of work too. I just uh, I just learned something new about Western New York that you guys have ice shields on your roof. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Here's a really awful story is this building that was a $100,000 roof. Right next to it, I had a contractor who was building out brand new patio homes. He calls me the one day and he's like, um, so I'm watching these roofers and there's no ice shield going on the roof. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> there has to be, because that was part of the whole reason we ripped the roof off because of all the ice jam. And he's like, yeah, there's not. So I called the owner of the company and he's like, no, like that wasn't in our, like, no, that's not included. And I was like, I know for sure it was because there was no way I would have done this roof without it. And he looked back and he was like, oh yeah, like I have the email here where you wanted the ice shield in it. And so they had to go back and redo that yeah. part and put the ice shield down. But can you tell once the roof is installed, whether or not the ice shield is there? Or does it have to be before? Like, I mean, I can't. Laid out? I mean, uh. maybe maybe someone who's an experienced roofer could or, you know, I'm yeah, sure yeah. there's. There's some way probably, but you, you never would have known is what I'm saying. Like had, yeah. had that person not caught uh, until, wow. until we had another issue with the roof and people started to, you know, pull up shingles, see what's going on or what then probably would have been told, but yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I just learned something new. Didn't know eye shields were a thing. Not something we have to worry about <laughs> here in California. <laughs> um, so your, your scope of work is basically the list of everything you want to fix, repair, change, et cetera, inside of that property. Um, Bigger Pockets has a great book by Jay Scott. He has uh, actually two books. Uh, one of them is the, the, the book on flipping houses. The other one's the, I think the book on estimating rehab costs. Two great books uh, that teach you how to build out your scopes of work. But um, literally, if you just walk through your property, start in the exterior, walk from the front of the house all the way around the perimeter of the property, looking for everything you want to change, open up the front door and walk around every single room, notating every single thing you want to change, that's your scope of work right there, right? And, you know, it's like, hey, replace this receptacle, change this baseboard, new flooring, tear out these old lights, you know, and literally just like in super layman's terms, write out every single little thing you want to do. And then there's your basic scope of work that you can then give to the contractors um, to, to get your quotes back. So I think a lot of people over overthink that scope of work. It seems super intimidating to come up with. But if you just look at your comps, and say, hey, I really like this flooring. I really like these kitchens. I really like these bathrooms. I really like these living rooms. I really like how this looks. Then just 
point out all the things that need to change between your property and the property you want it to look like. And then there's your scope of work and then put it on them to kind of go out, go out and price it out. We just had on the Real Estate Rookie boot camp uh, yesterday, we had Terrell Yarber on and he was talking about going in and doing photos. So he has someone on his team who goes to every property that they're looking at, you know, before they even put an offer in. He sends someone out and is taking photos of it. And that's how they actually build their scope of work off of the photos. And we we actually start doing this, too, because you can concentrate so much more sitting at your desk, looking at the photo of what needs to be repaired than standing there with your clipboard. Probably, you know, this time of year in Buffalo freezing because nobody has their heat on. If the place is vacant, try to write like, OK, there's this. That. But yeah. But you can you go. It, there was 180 pictures for a two bedroom, one bathroom mobile home. OK, so small, like probably it, maybe a thousand square feet or less, 180 photos of the outside, the inside. And it was like he was like kind of scanned through the photos and it was almost like a, a slideshow of all the pictures. Like you could see the layout of the house and the movement of the flow because it was just click, click click, click. As you're walking, you can zoom in on the photo to see. And that's how he would build his scope of work. He would sit and look at each picture and be like, okay, this railing here needs to be replaced and just add that and just go through each thing and keep going. And, you know, eventually he outsourced that and someone else on his team does that now. But he said, that's a a really great method that has worked for him, but also gives you the chance to like Google things too, Mm -hmm. as to like, is this like normal? Is this how it should be? (laughs) You know? And like, you can pr- pretty much add any photo to Google now and do like a search just on the photo too, as to like mm-hmm. somebody tell me this, or you can take the photo and you can post it in the bigger pockets forums and say, is the roof supposed to look like this? And you will get a million responses and <laughs> feedback yeah. from people. And they'll most likely probably turn that picture into a meme of, uh, here's a <laughs> slum landlord. <laughs> <you know? laughs> <laughs> Try to fix his roof himself. But. I do love the photo method. And, you know, I kind of picked that up from Taro and um, and Serena as well. Um, Serena uh, Norris was on one of our recent episodes. I'm sure you guys can look it up. Just Google Serena And Norris. so is Nate Robbins. Pockets. He's actually the one that so takes Nate the Robbins. pictures. Yeah. Anytime we do a rehab now, I try and get as many photos of that place as I can as well. And I have found that going back home and doing the, the scope work at home is easier. When I'm at the property, I'll take photos of every single room along with measurements. And I'm usually doing it on our iPad. Um, and I found that to be the easiest way to kind of move through the property. And then I'll also do a video walkthrough of the exterior and the interior. So I have all the photos and the videos and I can just go back anytime I want to try and piece everything together. Uh, I was just going to say Nate was episode 326 and Serena was episode 330. Boom. Ashley's stepping up for our, our producers. Snoozing on the job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the last part of, or the first part of this question is like just any any general tips you have for dealing with contractors. Um, the, the first thing I'd say is get it in writing, right? Uh, especially if this is your first time work th- working with the contractor, like get your scope of work in writing, get them to agree to everything that, that you have in that scope of work. Um, and make sure that not only is the work that you want done clear, but also the schedule of when they should be completing that work by and what the payment schedule is. Typically we want to backload that last payment. Right, so we want to hold back maybe 20% until that very final last thing is done. That way there's some incentive for them to move through the job quickly. Um, and you don't want to give that final payment until every single thing that you've identified to be wrong has been corrected. Because as soon as they get that last payment, it's going to be harder uh, harder to get a hold of them. Um, so those are my recommendations in dealing with contractors. Ash, what, do you have anything you'd add to that? Go through with your blue tape and mark everything that needs to be fixed. And like, sometimes it's beneficial to take a second set of eyes with you Hmm. to take a friend who's maybe never been to the property and be like, okay, walk around. Like what doesn't look normal in here and just send them through your property. And you know, maybe some things you're like, oh, well we had to do it this way or whatever. But like, it just gives that, you know, second set because you're already, well, at least I found this with myself is like, sometimes when I'm going through, I'm just like, Oh my God, it looks so good. Cause it's already 100 times better than it was before. And I'm like, not looking at the actual detail of stuff. Then there is other times where I'm so focused on the detail that I've like overpick nitpick things. So, yeah. um, definitely going through and blue taping before the contractor completely 
is done on the job. I was trying to find because I feel like uh, it was either Tarl or Serena, you know, one of our friends uh, mentioned there's actually an app that they used as well that was basically like a, a virtual blue tape where they could it's notate. James Daynard. Did. James said it, huh? Yeah. It's a uh, punch list, I think it is. Okay. There you go. Yeah. 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 So th there's so many different ways to kind of kind of mark off those, those because there's always going to be something when you do that final walkthrough. Um, Sarah and I, because we're, you know, we've got a pretty good relationship with our guy. We just sent him like a text or everything. He's just a pretty about knocking it out, but having that system to like really dial it in that the app, I think works pretty well as well. Yeah. I guess that, that is such a great point. Like I should clarify, like it is very easy to remember, not remember where you put blue tape. So the contract just pulls it off and like, <laughs> yeah. you know, oh, there's no blue tape <laughs> no left. Blue you tape. fixed everything. Yeah. Here's your job. <laughs> you know, so yeah. yeah, with James's app, you like take a picture of the imperfection and then you write a little note in the description mm -hmm. and then you can print it all out and he will literally like nail it into the house or tape it up or something and it, the whole list will be right there and then he'll still have that copy on his phone too. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this week's Rookie Reply. I'm Ashley here with my co-host, Tony J. Robinson. You can find us on Instagram down in the description. You can find our socials. And don't forget to join the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group and to hit that like button on YouTube if you're watching our videos. My uh, son, my six-year-old, just started uh, editing videos. And um, so he's been posting and started his own YouTube channel. And I have to say, he's already uh, every day home from school. How many subscribers do I have? So I have to find a way. I, I, I'm very glad he's getting into a skill for sure, but I, I, I'm not sure about the obsession of subscribers. Yeah, Mr. Beast is changing the next generation. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you guys. And we'll see you next time. Still, yeah.